Do you see it? I see ya. I see ya. Oh, okay, good. Good. Okay. Yeah. So, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Um, we are glad that you have joined us for uh, a Zoom seminar presented by uh, Dr. Mark Aaron from St. Thomas Heart. Uh, he's going to speak with us today about the successful living with heart failure. Um, Dr. Aaron is a cardiologist. Uh, like I said, with St. Thomas Hart, and he comes to Paris and has served Paris for many years. We're excited to have you join us, Dr. Aaron. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Tori. Uh, I'm going to try to take a real bread and butter approach to uh, heart failure education, and uh, hopefully you'll find this helpful. So first of all, I think it's important that we understand what we're talking about with heart failure. Oftentimes, I um, am asked to say, what is heart failure? And it sounds pretty dismal when you think about it. Um, oh, my heart has failed. Um, I think of it more as a uh, really big kind of garbage bin uh, definition, which can really refer to many different things that are going on with the heart. Uh, but the uh, fundamental cause or fundamental feature of heart failure, if you will, really is that uh, the heart is unable to meet all of the metabolic demands of the body. And how does this manifest? Um, it's usually symptoms such as fatigue or shortness of breath. Sometimes it's chest discomfort in the absence of any blockages and arteries of the heart. It can be uh, problems with swelling in the abdomen and in the legs. And it can also be problems with poor appetite or anorexia or even confusion. Uh, it could really be any of those things. Um, and uh, the, the common feature is that we find out that the heart's inability to meet all the metabolic demands causes problems with other organ systems. Uh, such as the kidneys or the lungs or, or sometimes even the brain. So what are some of the causes of heart failure? Well, because uh, heart failure really is a kind of garbage bin diagnosis that you know, accompanies many different things. There can be many different causes. Here in the United States, coronary artery disease is one of the primary causes of heart failure. And uh, when a physician is evaluating uh, a patient with heart failure, usually the first stop is to evaluate for coronary artery disease. This can be done with uh, heart catheterization by a cardiologist. It could also be done with non-invasive testing like stress testing or even uh, coronary CT imaging. Hypertension is also a very big contributor to heart failure. In fact, one of the uh, largest uh, heart studies in the United States, the Framingham Heart Study, uh, attributes over 50% of uh, the causes of heart failure in a population to hypertension. So it's very important that we control blood pressure to mitigate that risk of developing heart failure uh, in coming years. Sometimes faulty heart valves can contribute to heart failure, particularly aortic stenosis, aortic regurgitation, that is the aortic valve doesn't open properly and restricts uh, blood flow from the heart to the rest of the body. Or sometimes it can be mitral regurgitation where when the heart contracts, instead of pumping blood forward to the rest of the body, it pumps it uh, backwards toward the lungs. There is definitely an inherited component to heart failure, and uh, family history is very important. So uh, your physician may ask, did your parents or siblings or aunts or uncles have a history of heart failure? And if there is a strong family history, then it may be worth having genetic testing done. Sometimes infections of the heart muscle can cause heart failure. This can be certain viral infection. Uh, we know right now with the COVID-19 pandemic that it can directly affect the heart muscle and cause some heart failure. Uh, we also know that there are other infectious causes that also contribute as well. Smoking, alcohol, other recreational drugs can uh, contribute to the development of heart failure. 
uh, in particular, uh, alcohol in excess can contribute to that. Smoking contributes to coronary artery disease, which therefore leads to heart failure. So it all plays a role. Uh, being overweight uh, can contribute to heart failure both directly and indirectly by leading to the development of coronary artery disease or problems such as obstructive sleep apnea. Poor diet can be a contributor, uh, not just poor diet that we think of here in the United States, but perhaps worldwide where there really are problems with malnutrition. Sometimes those, those uh, issues of malnutrition can lead to heart failure. And then it's also important to remember uh, that stress contributes to the development of heart disease, both with uh, the, the development of coronary disease and uh, heart attacks, but also even profound stresses can cause uh, what we call a broken heart syndrome, which can lead to heart failure uh, in the uh, absence of any other causes than a profound emotional uh, distress. So let's talk a little bit about what you can do as uh, a person who is living with heart failure. First of all, I, I want to dispel any uh, notions that uh, a diagnosis of heart failure means that you really need to be um, uh, inactive and just uh, sit in the chair and take it easy all day long. We know now that moderate physical activity is very important to helping your body go stronger and helping you uh, live successfully with heart failure. Uh, short uh, episodes of activity, 20 to 30 minutes, as you can tolerate them, two to three times a day can be very effective. Uh, when you're first starting out, short walks are a good way to do this. And just kind of walk as long as you can. Even two or three minutes is better than nothing. Since we do live here in the South, it's very important to be mindful of temperature extremes. Uh, during the peak of summer, it's not uh, wise to get out and try to exercise during the middle of the day, but instead plan your activities around times when it's cooler, like first thing in the morning or, or in the evening, right before sunset. And the activity can really be anything that you find enjoyable. It doesn't have to be going to the gym, biking, or working on a treadmill, but instead just going for walks, uh, biking with kids or grandkids, fishing, gardening, anything like that is appropriate. The, the most important thing is just that you stay active. It's also important that you listen to your body. And uh, if you start feeling really poorly, a little bit of too much shortness of breath, or if you start having a chronic cough or feel chest discomfort or dizziness, that's your body telling you that it's time to take a break. Uh, sometimes fast heartbeats, same thing. If it's an unpleasant sensation, it's important that you listen to what your body's saying and, and don't push yourself. And it's also important to know that if you uh, can't get these symptoms to go away after rest, to call your doctor or to go to the emergency room. Let's talk a little bit about diet. This is a uh, difficult subject uh, for us Southerners. Uh, one of the things that we have to focus on uh, is limiting fluids. And what I often tell my patients is that any amount of fluid that you put into your body, um, if it is excessive and causes swelling or shortness of breath, we've got to figure out a way to get it off with medication. So the more you put on your body, the more that we've got to get off. And therefore, we usually start by recommending that patients with heart failure limit their fluid intake to no more than two liters or two quarts a day. And fluid, I define really as anything that can be poured. So um, that's coffee, colas, milk, orange juice, uh, ice, which melts. But it's also important to keep in mind that uh, fruits that are particularly juicy, like watermelon or cantaloupe, that you really need to uh, count uh, servings of those type of fruit as liquids as well. And as I alluded to earlier, you can always drink more liquids than your doctors can remove. So it really ends up being uh, to your benefit to limiting that fluid so we don't need to use as much uh, medication, particularly diuretics, to get the fluid off. And we um, always need to remember that this extra fluid can contribute to worsening of heart failure and that worsening heart failure um, also contributes to more time in the hospital 
and a shortened life expectancy. So some of the hints that I give patients with limiting fluids is uh, refrigerating those fruits and vegetables, making sure they're ice cold when you eat them between meals. Chewing on ice cubes is a good way to kind of slowly uh, get, keep your mouth moist without drinking too much liquid. Using small glasses, uh, six ounce glasses, eight ounce glasses, um, is a way to kind of limit your servings. Also using things that you can put in your mouth that don't necessarily uh, uh, constitute extra fluid that you're taking in, but rather just stimulate uh, your body to make its own saliva to keep your mouth moist. So mints, gum, or lollipops are all beneficial. What I sometimes tell my patients to do is to take an empty two liter soda bottle and every time you take a glass of say eight ounces of water, uh, when you consume that glass, uh, take the same glass, fill it up with water, and pour that into the soda bottle. That's a very visual way to uh, keep track of your fluid consumption and also pace yourself as you go through your day. The sodium diet is certainly a sore point here in the South, and uh, why it's important that we are careful about that is that salt or sodium in your food makes it much more difficult for your body to rid itself of fluid. That's true even in someone who does not have heart failure, but uh, if you do have heart failure, it uh, makes it even more difficult to get rid of that fluid. It's also important to realize that if you're able to limit the amount of sodium that you take in your body, that you may be able to limit the amount of diuretics that you take, that you have to take fluid off your body, or you may be able to uh, eliminate them completely. Um, I acknowledge with all my patients that changing diet and taste is very difficult and it's going to take time, but um, it is important to continue working to try to limit your sodium. I tell patients to usually limit their sodium to about 2,000 milligrams per day. And as a frame of reference there, one teaspoon of salt has uh, more than 2,400 milligrams of sodium. So just a teaspoon of salt will uh, get you over your daily limit. Uh, I ask my patients not to use the salt shaker at all to avoid canned foods. And if you must use canned foods, to certainly rinse them with water before cooking them. And for our seasoning of foods to replace your salt with garlic, onions, or peppers. And it becomes very important to read labels. So you can see here in the illustration, one of the common food labels we see on so many of the foods that we buy packaged today, uh, it's important that you educate yourself and get familiar with uh, that label. And as you can see right at the bottom of the uh, magnifying glass, you can see sodium in milligrams. One serving of this food contains 650 milligrams. So make yourself a very smart consumer and um, if not actually writing down the amount of sodium, at least have a, a good idea of how much sodium you've had in the day so that you can pace yourself and hopefully avoid having to take even more medications. You see here some of the suggestions for replacing salt. I think I've already kind of covered all those. So we'll move on to the next topic. So let's talk a little bit about heart failure medications. Uh, these uh, broadly, or uh, classes of medicines that your doctor may put you on uh, to treat your heart failure. Uh, the top four medications, uh, top four classes of medications, um, are all classes of medications that have been shown to help people with heart failure live longer, stay out of the hospital, and feel better. And we'll talk about each one of them in uh, a turn. So ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, and then angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitors. So that's all a big mouthful. Uh, it's probably easier to remember ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and ARNIs. There's only one ARNI right now, and that's Entresto, and we'll talk a little bit about that. You can see here some of the benefits of these classes of drugs. They do lower blood pressure. Uh, they reduce the workload on the heart. And by mechanisms that are more complicated than just that mechanism by which they lower blood pressure or reducing the workload on the heart, they actually can lengthen lifespan and help prevent hospitalization. 
Examples of the ACE inhibitors would include lisinopril, any other medication, the generic name of which ends in pril, is going to be an ACE inhibitor. ARBs, the losartan is an example, and any other drug that ends in the name sartan uh, is an ARB. And then, of course, in Tresto, they've been on the TV ad uh, circuit pretty frequently recently. In Tresto, it's unique in that it's the only drug currently available, uh, which is both an angiotensin receptor blocker and a neprilysin inhibitor. Uh, and in the right patients, this drug may be preferred over both ACE inhibitors and ARBs. And it's important that these drugs are taken on an empty stomach unless you're told by your physician to take them with food. And there are situations I've told my patients to take them with food. Some of the side effects to be mindful of, about 10% of the population um, has another enzyme called bradykinin. Well, everyone has bradykinin, but about 10% of the population um, is particularly sensitive to the, inhib the inhibition of their bradykinin by the ACE inhibitors. And buildup of bradykinin causes a cough, uh, which we'll see in patients. Other side effects include uh, raising potassium and swelling of the face or tongue, which I haven't read there. That's also called angioedema. That is considered a medical emergency. If you do have swelling of the face or tongue after taking any of these drugs, you should stop that drug right away and actually seek uh, medical attention. Some of the precautions with this drug is to avoid salt substitutes because Salt substitutes typically are made with potassium salt, and therefore you're getting a double whammy of taking in potassium and then also raising your potassium with the ACE inhibitors and other drugs. Medicines like ibuprofen or uh, drugs that are called non-steroidals, uh, these drugs, although they may be great for pain and swelling, can limit the effectiveness of the ACE inhibitors and can also promote fluid retention in the body. So I always counsel my patients, if they do need to take medications like ibuprofen, to take it in the lowest effective dose and to take it as infrequently as possible. The next big class of drugs to be mindful of are the beta blockers. Uh, these drugs lower blood pressure and slow heart rate and reduce the workload on the heart. Through other uh, mechanisms, they also help reduce heart arrhythmias. They also lengthen the lifespan and prevent hospitalization, and that's why physicians would use them on you. So examples of beta blockers include carbidolol, metoprolol, succinate, and bisoprolol. And unlike the uh, ACE inhibitors, where we think that the effect is a class effect, meaning all ACE inhibitors provide benefit, um, the FDA here in the United States has found that really only the three beta blockers that I show listed there um, are uh, effective for the treatment of heart failure. Um, there may be other beta blockers that your physician may choose to use for a reason particular to you, but those three beta blockers are the ones that um, are approved for use in heart failure and are considered part of guideline-directed medical therapy. Side effects for beta blockers, like the ACE inhibitors, include cough. It's a different mechanism, particularly in patients who may have a little bit of asthma. They can also cause wheezing. Uh, heart block can occasionally occur. Uh, impotence uh, in males is certainly a concern. And GI upset can also be a concern. Um, if you do experience other side effects, it's important to discuss it with your physician rather than just discontinuing the medication uh, suddenly. Uh, the cautions, as you, should, as you can see there, uh, unlike the ACE inhibitors, the beta blockers should be taken with food, especially carvedilol, to minimize side effects. And so one of the first things I ask if my patients tell me they're having difficulty taking beta blockers is, well, are you taking it with some food on your stomach? The next class, is broadly called aldosterone blockers. And just like the other two classes we've talked about, they lower blood pressure and reduce workload in the heart, help lengthen lifespan and prevent hospitalization. So the uh, two examples that you may be prescribed are spironolactone 
antiplerinone. The side effects you see there, like the ACE inhibitors, they can also raise potassium. In addition to that, they also lower sodium. Uh, and a side effect that's uh, unique to spironolactone, uh, it can cause gynecomastia, which is breast enlargement and tenderness. Um, most notable in males, uh, males tend to get upset with that. Um, if it does occur with spironolactone, your physician can make a change to eplerinone, which should not have that side effect. And then like the other medications, it can also have GI upset. Uh, this next statement is something I hear frequently. Um, yes, one uh, would consider spironolactone and eplerinone diuretics. However, the amount of diuretic effect that we see at the doses we usually use for heart failure is pretty minimal. So um, when your physicians uh, ask you about being on diuretics, they're not usually thinking about spironolactone. They're usually thinking of uh, other drugs like furosemide, which I'll talk about in the future. Okay, this is the newest one that uh, merits discussion, and um, it's so new, in fact, that a lot of uh, providers probably aren't discussing it yet uh, with their patients. These are called the sodium glucose transport inhibitors, um, or SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, this refers to a, a protein in the kidneys. It was originally developed for the treatment of diabetes, uh, but it's been found to also be beneficial in the treatment of heart failure. Uh, it actually can lengthen life and reduce hospitalization as well. These drugs promote urination by making the kidneys excrete sugar into the urine. Examples include Farziga and Jardiance. Side effects are uh, nausea like many other drugs, but uh, genital infections such as yeast infections and urinary tract infections. Again, because you're, uh, you have sugar in your urine and that uh, promotes uh, the growth of bacteria. And as I said before, because these drugs are so new, many healthcare providers aren't near yet aware of their use and heart failure and insurances often aren't even aware of their use. So providers may have a little bit of pushback from insurance uh, companies and in paying for it, usually with discussion with the uh, medical directors and with uh, completing prior authorizations, we are able to get our drugs approved. So to rehash for this for just a second, uh, I've talked about four classes of medicine that have all been shown to be beneficial in terms of helping people with heart failure live longer, improving their quality of life, and helping to keep them out of the hospital. And that's broadly the YACE inhibitors, the beta blockers, the aldosterone inhibitors, and the SGLT2 inhibitors. Going to touch on uh, diuretics also very broadly because these drugs are often used in the treatment of heart failure. Uh, when we talk about diuretics, and I'm excluding spironolactone and aplerinone in this discussion, we're talking about drugs that uh, work at two different spots in the kidneys. We sometimes refer to the loop diuretics and the thiazide type diuretics. Uh, these work at the loop of Henle and in, and in the collecting tubules of the kidneys. Um, because they work in different spots, it's not any common for your providers to use both these types of diuretics to complement one another. They're used simply to get rid of excess fluid. So they're really for uh, symptom relief and uh, improvement in quality of life. And examples include furosemide, Torsamide and then the thiazides like uh, hydrochlorothiazide or HCTZ. You can see there are some of the side effects, uh, which include low potassium, kidney dysfunction, gout, nausea, and even photosensitivity or uh, a propensity to develop sunburn if you're out too much. What you'll also notice here is that I haven't really said that these diuretics help you live longer or stay out of the hospital. So. No uh, study has ever shown that they've been effective to do that. And so for that reason, we want to use the lowest effective dose. And that's also why it's so very important that you uh, limit fluid intake to allow us to use the lowest possible dose. 
So I'm going to end up my talk before we open up for questions with just a little bit of a conceptual talk about the traffic lights for the heart failure zone, green, yellow, and red. And so the green zone is really where we want you to be all the time. Your symptoms are under control. You're not having chest pain. You're not having shortness of breath at rest. And hopefully you can perform most of your activities of daily living without shortness of breath. You're not having any uh, changes in your weight from day to day, and you're not having any swelling uh, of your uh, arms, legs, or abdomen. The yellow zone is the warning zone, the caution zone, and that's when you should be in touch with your doctor or your provider. Uh, symptoms that are occurring in the yellow zone include an increase in your shortness of breath, a weight gain. Uh, what I usually tell my patients, if you gain more than two pounds overnight or three pounds in a week, that merits a phone call. If you're having uh, swelling of the legs or the abdomen, or if you're unable to get around performing your normal activities of daily living, these are all uh, warning signs that uh, something bad may be brewing and it's time to call your doctor before things get out of control. And then lastly is the red zone. Uh, this is definitely a call your doctor or go to the emergency room if you can't get in touch with them right away. This is when you're experiencing shortness of breath at rest, not just with exertion. When you've had a greater weight gain, instead of two pounds overnight, five pounds overnight. Um, if you're having chest pain that you can't um, seem to relieve, or if you're having confusion, um, these are all uh, signs that you need a, a more careful and thorough evaluation than what could just be done over the telephone, and it does merit uh, a visit with your doctor uh, or to the emergency room. So that's the end of the, my prepared comments. I see we have a, just a few people online, and I'd like to open up for any questions that anyone might have. I actually, I, I've gotten a couple of questions, um, Dr. Aaron, related to COVID and how it's affected the heart. Um, what should someone look for after recovering that might be a lingering symptom worthy of seeking treatment? Um, and, and have you had issues with uh, current heart failure patients that have had um, lasting COVID effects? That's a great question. Um, the short answer is yes and yes. Um, so lingering effects for that are specific to the heart after COVID are very similar to the symptoms that I started out the talk with uh, related to heart failure. So uh, shortness of breath, that doesn't seem to be getting better as you get further away from a COVID infection, or if you um, are having swelling that you never had before, if you're having uh, fatigue, performing your activities of daily living um, that don't seem to be getting better as you get further away from the COVID infection. Those are all things that point towards something more being more going on, and it certainly warrants a visit to your provider um, to see if uh, you may be developing some heart complications. In terms of uh, heart failure patients who've had COVID infections, uh, I've had the full gamut. Um, I've had heart failure patients, uh, very elderly, who um, if you were asked up front, would they survive a COVID infection, you would say uh, the odds are not great, um, who actually did just fine. They were ill, they may or may not have been hospitalized, but they weathered it just fine and were, were able to resume their normal activities after a month or so. And then I've had the other extreme too. I've had several very dear heart failure patients to me who contracted COVID and have died from it, not just from the, the short-term complications, which of course we probably hear about in the news, but then even also the longer-term uh, sequelae. Um, they may survive that acute COVID infection, um, but uh, because they have these pre-existing illnesses, um, they have uh, not, uh, they don't have as much reserve to recover and 
and may um, die from complications of the COVID uh, several months later. So that's why it's so important to get your vaccine when you can. Do we have any other questions out there? I don't see anything on the chat. I did okay. absolutely learn some interesting things. I, you know, never really thought about um, fruit and, and different things that contain a lot of water affecting the amount of, of water or liquid in time. Right. About right. I just never really thought about that. So. Yeah. Definitely some really good points and um, good information. And uh, we appreciate you so much sharing with us today. And we're glad to have you um, serving the Paris community uh, when, when you come this way. Uh, I know that you uh, see patients in our Kelly Clinic, and uh, mm -hmm. we are very glad that you're here. So well, anything else you. you'd like to share with us today? No, not at all. Just uh, I, I, I do encourage uh, everyone to be uh, smart consumers, um, to educate themselves about heart failure from reputable sources, and to seek out health care if you've got any questions. Okay. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate you being with us today. Well, thank and thanks you. everyone who tuned in. All right. Thank you. Have a good day.